Hey there, welcome aboard the SS Botchcast. This is your captain speaking. Let's jump right into it. Oh, and in case you're new around here, all we talk about is failure, bloopers, bobbles, and blunders. It's like looking at the before home improvement photos, pre-renovation kind of thing. Mr. David Cohen joins us today. David is a serial tech entrepreneur, advisor, investor, and he founded Techstars, an accelerator based in Boulder. I'll tell you what an accelerator is. Here's the gist. Imagine your new startup company needs some juice to get going. So you apply for and join an accelerator. It's a 90 day intensive program, usually 90 days, includes other companies in what's called a cohort, usually. You're put through a rigorous curriculum and there's a bunch of awesome mentors as well. Usually at the end, they do what's called a demo day where they invite investors in and many get funded on the spot or you know, sort of shortly thereafter. In exchange for all this, the company gives the accelerator a small equity stake in the business. Um, And many of these also give you cash at the end of the program too. So you give up ownership in the company a little bit and you get this awesome program to get you off the ground. Many of them also give you cash. Techstars gives their startups $120,000 after demo day. So good luck getting in though. The acceptance rates for these kinds of accelerators is literally more uh, selective than most Ivy League undergrad programs. Crazy. So Techstars that uh, David founded is considered one of the largest and most prominent accelerators in the world. Depending on exactly how you measure it, there's lots of ways you could measure it. They're considered as number two, the second most kind of prominent or largest accelerators in the world. They're huge and awesome, literally helped thousands of companies go to market according to their website. Here's the number I just read, 2,157 companies and funded with over $9 billion in capital. Very cool stuff. By the way, Brad Feld, one of our previous guests on the Botchcast, one of the founders of Techstars as well. So is our governor here in Colorado, the great state of Colorado, Jared Polis is one of the other founders of Techstars. Interesting little connection there. I tend to find entrepreneurs and venture capitalists like David to have a unique perspective. Success and failure and risk and reward and upside and downside and wasting money, making money, you know, all of these big kind of fortunes. It's the daily world that they swim in. Failure isn't some, you know, distant villain. It's a story they're trying to avoid day in, day out, especially Right now, today's economic environment is crazy and causing all kinds of turmoil for entrepreneurs. David's a discussion I put in the category that we call the head. Welcome to the Botchcast, Mr. David Cohen. Thanks for joining me today, Dave. Totally psyched to be here. Thanks for having me. So when you hear about a podcast about failure and that you've been invited to be a guest on it, what runs through your head? Yes, for me, I think that there's too much celebration of the outlier and not enough inspection of all the activity. So a uh, big fan of talking about things that don't work and being real about it because I think there's more learning in that than in the success cases most often. So it's a great topic. Yeah, good. And as a startup guy, both on the operation kind of operator side and now much more on the, on the investor advisor side. How would you say your view of failure has shifted, grown, changed, and kind of looking back on your view of failure and how it's shifted over time? Yeah, I'd say, you know, early in my career, you know, failure was something to be scared of, to try to avoid And I always thought of it as sort of macro failure, right? Like I'm I'm working on this company or I'm in this job and I might fail. And that creates fear in your heart, right? Like you just want to avoid failure. And then as you sort of mature in your career and maybe get fortunate enough to have some successes, either micro or macro, you realize that that's, as I said, where all the learning is. And so fast forward to, you know, 35 years into the career, right? It's, now as an investor, right, I, I often say that my favorite entrepreneur to invest in is, is somebody that has a 
experience both success and failure mm -hmm. um, success because you know they can do it and failure because you know they know what the other side of that feels like mm -hmm. and they have motivation to avoid it and in particular if they've succeeded and then most recently failed that's a really interesting opportunity to me because you know that makes you pissed off right and that makes mm -hmm. you want to redeem yourself mm -hmm. so i think it's part of the game it's part of the process and you know I fail all the time. Hopefully that's at a micro level and you learn from it and not at a macro level, but I've also had macro level failures. Mm -hmm. How do you tend to respond emotionally, physiologically, even in like a moment of failure? You know, some people kind of get red in the face or some people, do you tend to have kind of a standard response? Yeah, I think, it's never exactly the same, of course. And some things are, you're a little more disconnected from emotionally than others. But I would say that, you know, if I'm being introspective about how I handle it, there's usually a period of time. It's probably relative to the, you know, the bigness of the failure, <laughs> right. uh, the magnitude of the failure. But there's a period of time where I probably get pretty down. It's probably in, in an unhealthy way, but it's, how I deal with it. And, you know, you might see me moping around, you know, if, I, if I'm on the board of a company that fails and, you know, we lost $5 million in that investment, that that's going to hit me for three or four days and bring out the imposter syndrome. And, you know, why, why didn't anybody trust me to invest that money? And, you know, what could I have done better? And there's sort of probably a mopey phase, right? Where I'm pretty grumpy and I'm not very happy for a few days. And then it tends to you know, I get that sort of annoyed energy, right? Where it's like, you know, well, okay, let's get back at it, right? Like, let's, let's get back on the, on the bike and go again, right? Mm -hmm. And like, it motivates you in a way because when you're able to take stock of it, you realize that there's a lot more positive stuff than negative stuff, hopefully. And it sort of makes you want to redouble your efforts. But I go through that wave for sure. Yeah. One thing that's been interesting is talking to people on this topic is almost this mentality that, losing is what teaches us how to win. And that can almost get taken to an extreme where there's almost like this craving of failure. There's been moments in my own journey where I know I've even sort of signed up for things that I knew I would fail at. Like I even signed up for a marathon that I hadn't trained for just to kind of do it out of will instead of sort of skill. How do you view that almost like idolization of failure? Is that healthy? You've probably seen that a lot in the startup world. How do you respond to that idea? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't necessarily identify with it personally. I do come across it in the broader universe. You know, when I think about the Wright brothers trying to fly, you know, in some field in North Carolina, right? Like they're going to fail, right? Like that's never going to work, right? But the things worth doing are things that you might fail at. And you just try to limit the consequences of that failure, like, you know, not dying while you're trying to fly <laughs> so that you can try again. Yeah. Um, but everything worth doing is hard and hard things, you know, often generate failure. Right. So I don't, you know, the, the notion that I actually want to fail is pretty foreign to me. I know that others would say in a micro sense, and maybe I've said that a couple of times, so that's a thing to draw out a little bit, you know, micro failures in the context of startups, that is powerful. It happens every day. It means you're trying something. You're trying to get product market fit. It's not working. You learn from that. You try a different way. It's not working. Try a different way. You finally mm -hmm. get it. That's the process, right? And so you should want that type of failure. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to me at the macro level to say, I actually, you know, I started this company and I kind of knew it was going to fail and it did. And that's cool. And I learned from it. Sure. You know, in hindsight, you're going to have that thought about it that you learn from it. But in the moment, it's never what you wanted, right? Mm -hmm. So this dichotomy between micro and macro failures, I think, is really healthy because especially when you talk about the sort of lean startup mentality and start fast, fail fast, learn fast, all that kind of stuff, you know, is very much kind of a part of our startup culture. On the macro failure side, what of those in your own journey, Dave, really stand out? Like when you look back and you'd say, yeah, lots of micro failures, what are the big macro ones that have really shaped your journey? Yeah, well, I wrote about one company that I started. It was called iContact. Some of you may know iContact. That was not mm -hmm. my company. That was Ryan Alice's company, which he exited for many hundreds of millions of dollars. But I sold him the domain name when my company that was called iContact failed. <laughs> um, oh, I didn't know that. That's great. Our early life lesson is that I should have taken equity instead of cash for that. Wow. Um, because Ryan did a great job with, with that brand. 
but that company failed and I wrote about why it failed. I have a blog post blog. I think it's called life in the Deadpool, which is just, you know, cathartic, right. To reflect back on what went wrong, why it went wrong. And, you know, at that moment in time in my career, you know, this was after we had had a success with our first company. I say we, because I've co-founded several companies with David Brown. He's my partner here at Techstars as well. And we, you know, we had a positive exit and we, literally sat around thinking about what was the next company we were going to create. And in hindsight, the macro failure was triggered by that business notion coming from something that we felt was cool rather than something we were actually passionate about. Mm, Something that a spreadsheet said should work rather than something we actually cared about Mm. changing in the world. And it was a mobile social network like, you know, Foursquare or other things that you may be familiar with, but before app stores, before distribution, you know, to mobile phones. And it was a a great concept and later companies would be built around this concept, but, you know, we executed it well, but timing was wrong, right? We didn't have distribution. We had to somehow try to get this app on a phone that there was no app store for. And guess what? That's a big margin killer and a big challenge. So, you know, That was a macro failure of a company where I lost, you know, my money and other people's money that we had taken in. We were fortunate to return a big chunk of other people's money and really mostly lose our money, but that's painful and, you know, goes in the loss column as a company you founded, but you know, you, you learn from it and you move on. And what I learned from it is never invest in anything that's not coming from a place of intrinsic motivation where you actually care about changing something in the world and that is being done for the right reasons because it's going to get hard. And if it's too hard, you're just going to quit. And so you've got to have something really driving you to change the world in that way. So I I took that away. I learned that and I apply it to my investing activity today. How would you say even the sequence of these, so you had your first company, then you had eye contact, which didn't succeed. And then ear feeder was after that. How would you say ear feeder was concretely different because of eye contact in between? Yeah. So ear feeder was a company, you know, for context that, you know, looked at what music that you were listening to, right. Or were subscribed to, or were, downloading back in the day and would, you know, essentially create a custom news feed around, Hey, here's new songs by artists you like, here's concert tickets, here's, you know, special events you Mm -hmm. can buy. It was essentially an affiliate model, but it came from like, I was literally sitting around one day, you know, using an early iTunes thing and saying like, why do I have to go search for like the the next, I want a concert from these people. Just just tell me, right? Like, I don't know when they're, yeah, exactly. I don't know when they're coming to town. This is stupid. So it was an actual problem that I had mm-hmm. as opposed to eye contact, which was, you know, I can imagine how this thing would be, you know, cool and powerful to young people, right? It wasn't something that I had struggled with myself or came from my own personal experience. Now, I would say it was the same in a lot of ways. I hadn't totally internalized that lesson yet when I started the next company because, you know, frankly, we got very lucky. Right. If you go look up TechCrunch articles on your feeder, and this thing was massively viral, right? It had an affiliate business model, which is a challenging business model, right? It's it's sort of like advertising. You gotta get real scale against it. And, you know, there were others building things that this was sort of a feature of that they yeah. ended up buying. And it, and it was almost no time in my career. It was probably a six to nine month thing where we started a company, it went viral, we sold it. And I think in selling it, it was sort of like almost honestly like a side project more than a company, right? As I look back on it, it was like a thing to do while I didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was using my hacker skills because I, you know, started as a programmer and having fun with it. And I cared about making something great and people used it. And, you know, it probably wasn't ever going to be a big standalone business. So I'm glad that the opportunity cost came back, you know, that was there came back to me in the form of time because I was able to sell it pretty early. And then I think there was a much more thoughtful period about what would be next, right? As opposed to just jumping into something. Mm -hmm. How long would it take after eye contact that you could process and identify that the factor for failure there was that it was something you, a pain you hadn't felt? How, How long did it take you to realize that was what was going on? I don't even know today how I would answer that question because I think, you know, the answer that people want to hear is 
you know, I sat around in my lounge chair in front of a fire and I thought deeply about, uh, pipe probably what had transpired, (laughs) you know, but it's honestly like, it's more little by little brick by brick, right. That, that solidifies in your mind. And probably the the truthful answer there is I don't think I totally internalized it probably for five or 10 years, right? Like Mm -hmm. writing blog posts about failure helps. It's something I encourage all entrepreneurs to do. And I'm fine if they wait a year after it fails because it hurts, but it makes you writing things down makes you think, and it makes you be articulate about, you know, what's actually in your head because you're imagining someone else reading it. And, you know, it's not, a moment that it happens because of deep reflection, it's, you know, a set of experiences where probably I had done 20 or 30 angel investments too. And I had learned from some of those, but it becomes part of your character of who you are as an investor. Like, you know, I don't care how great the spreadsheet is. I need to know that there's a reason you're going to go when it's hard as that's, that's the challenge. Mm. Yeah. And is that something you run into a lot where people have some genius idea on paper, but you just don't sense the fire in them about it all the time. It's a part of my daily experience to, you can read it in the words and you can feel it in the meeting. I mentioned intrinsic motivation earlier. This is, you know, not coming from a spreadsheet, but coming about giving a crap about what you're doing, about, you know, the future, the way the world works and how people experience it and your own pride that you can attach to that in a future projection. That's what I'm looking for because, you know, if it's, I thought of this idea and it seems like it's on trend and, you know, here's the spreadsheet that shows how much money we make. That to me is the early red flag, right? And I can't get the why out of the person that actually feels real. Mm-hmm. I just stay away from it. And I'll probably miss some stuff that way. I, you know, it's not like any investor has a perfect algorithm, but it is a component of an algorithm that I believe in. So you, as an investor, you're seeing, I don't know what percentage of deals you invest in that you look at, but you're definitely rejecting a heck of a lot more deals that you're seeing than you're investing in. You've talked about some of these things that would trigger kind of the, and for that reason, I'm out, response, including you don't get their why or you don't get their intrinsic kind of gut. What are some other yellow red flags that are just kind of these automatic, these folks are going to fail, I'm not a part of this? What are some of those other ones? Yeah, so again, it's not automatic they're going to fail. It's a risk-adjusted assessment. Yeah. Like the last thing is I I want to portray that I somehow know. Uh, I don't think any investor knows. It's heuristics, right? I think, I can't remember the name of the book, but there's a great book about, you know, every decision you make should have a confidence level, right? It's, if I have an 80% confidence level that that is a reason why a company is going to die, that's good enough for me, right? Like there's better things to put my money into. Mm -hmm. So we do fund at the accelerator about, you know, 2% of what we see. And I have, you know, 51, 52 managing directors, right? Running these accelerator programs that are bringing stuff in, right? From the tens of thousands of companies we look at every year. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to train that out, but also, you know, allow people to have their own biases because, and I say biases intentionally, right? It's hopefully about belief in market or belief in team and not somehow associated with who the person is. That's a, a bias that can be harmful, but some biases that can be helpful, uh, you know, that, that they believe strongly, you know, I don't want to work, for example, with, they might say, I don't want to work with companies that are founded by a single person. It's not that single founder companies can never be successful. It's that it's hard for them to be successful in the context of an accelerator. And when you're down, there's not somebody that can pull you up, right, as a co-founder. Mm-hmm. And it's just a lot harder. So on a risk-adjusted basis, you know, in the accelerator, we tend to stay away from that. Someone may say, I don't want to fund anything that, you know, has to do with ad tech because I just don't care about it. Okay, good. That's a bias you should have. Yeah. And I don't want you investing in something you don't care about because you're not going to be energetic and help that founder succeed. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's a combination of tech stars beliefs, but also the individual beliefs of the managing directors running these programs. And the union of that is where we want to focus uh, because there is lots of opportunity out there. But those are some examples. I think, you know, single founder team is a big one for us. We obviously stay away from certain markets, right? We're not funding companies that are in, you know, pornography or illegal drug right, distribution or, or even something like marijuana, which isn't generally accepted, mm-hmm. you know, as legal all over the world, just off brand for us, not something that we're interested in doing. But, you know, it's sort of a, a set of things that you care about and then the broader team that mm-hmm. you care about as well. Yeah.
Rewind a little bit and think back to even sort of high school, maybe college. Do you have any big pre-career fumbles that you would say really stick in your mind that have shaped your, your view of the world? Oh, that's a good one. I don't, you know, maybe one's a fumble and one's a, a thing that I think was impactful, you know, and I know you want to get to the failure stuff, so I'll, I'll balance it. But, you know, I think my dad was an entrepreneur and he was a certified public accountant, mm -hmm. which is a different kind of entrepreneurship, but he had his own firm and his name was on the door. And, you know, there were 30 or 50 people there that depended on him. And I got to work there, right? I was doing data entry for like payroll systems and stuff. And it, mm -hmm. it sort of sparked my early interest in computers and it sparked, you know, my early interest in entrepreneurship. So just sort of fortunate to have that experience on the failure side, you know, again, micro failure, right? When I was in college, I, you know, played tennis. I played division one tennis hmm. and I always thought, man, I'm going to be like, you know, this pro tennis player. The and next I thought I was Roger so great. Federer. Oh yeah. Cause I was like number <laughs> one on my high school team. Yeah. The sky's the limit. Right. And I was ranked in the state of Florida as a junior and, you know, sort of rising in those rankings. And I thought, Oh great. I'm, I'm going to go to college and I'm going to play division one tennis, and get a scholarship. And, you know, that was a, a disaster in that, you know, I barely made the team. I lost a lot of self-esteem around that and self-identity yeah. around that. Yeah, I did make the team. I, I played number six uh, where there were six spots that play. We lost a lot. I lost a lot. And in that period of time, I was very addicted to Coke. I like to say that it was Coca-Cola, um, <laughs> but I was a big yep. caffeine drinker. I would drink like two liter bottles of caffeine. Oh my goodness. Hours. Crazy. Wow. Yeah. Um, and it was all, you know, it was all to try to make tennis the thing. And, you know, two years in, I realized my grades are terrible. My professors were telling me, you got to quit tennis. You got to focus on your studies. And so there's a thing you associate with since the time you're like eight years old that suddenly comes to an end when mm -hmm. you're 20. Mm -hmm. Right. And I didn't play again for 10 years. Now I play recreationally, but, but identity loss is a big thing. And I think pre-career, like I had to deal with that. And I think every company I've started since then, you have your identity wrapped up in it. Mm -hmm. uh, and part of being an entrepreneur is you will eventually lose that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a strange thing that's, I don't know if it's driven by American culture or what, but a lot of us fall into this trap of, you know, we are what we do and our value comes from what we do, how we spend our time as opposed to this sense of being. And I mean, that's even part of my own journey is, is like, it's not about our accomplishments. My kids don't give a rip. You know, at the end of the day, they care about having a great, dad, you know, as opposed to what the resume says. For sure. Yeah. I mean, we hold on to these identities that are just part of us, right? Yeah. And so tangential. When you're young, you think this is my identity. This is all I am. This is who I am. Mm -hmm. And I lose that. I'm nothing, but you're not alone in losing it and transitioning to your next thing. You know, right now I have a lot of my identity wrapped up in tech stars, right? It's, it's how people know me. But it's not, to your point, it's not how my family knows me. It's not how my, you know, kids know me. It's how, you know, more people than would otherwise know me here in Colorado know me or know of me. And, you know, to lose that is a loss, right? If that were to go away, but it's a normal loss. It's just a part of transitioning in, in life's different phases. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what's interesting is the overlap between sort of sports and the startup world, right? And this kind of grit and perseverance. This is a fun thing to think about is of our character traits, where did they come from? Like where's kind of the avenue and sports is really common, right? Like just learning how to grit through and work hard. Sounds like sports has been a part of your story. Any other areas of life where you'd say, this is part of where I learned grit and a healthy view of failure. Is there other other categories of how you've spent time? Yeah, I mean, I think early on, I go back to what I said earlier about my dad, like, you know, tax season, watching him not come home, you know, dinner getting cold. You feel that as a loss as a kid, but you also feel a respect for it when you walk through his office and his name's on the door and you, you see these people that depend on him and love him for creating the jobs and for doing the good work that they do for mm -hmm. their clients. Right. And I mean, that's the definition of grit is like, it gets hard, right? And tax season is like an example of when it gets hard for an accountant, you know, for an investor, it gets hard when a company tells you that, you know, or you know that it's just not going to work and there's real money being lost. So I do think it's interesting that when you asked me that question, my first two answers were sports and dad, you know, and that 
I think is largely when I think back on who I am, that those two things have shaped me a lot Mm -hmm. and the experiences from them. So I just go back to those things. Some of the interviews on the podcast, there's this interesting dynamic between failure and that sadness and its relationship to joy. This is the moral of the story of the movie Inside Out, the Pixar movie, is there's a strange paradoxical relationship between sadness and joy. Joy is like the antibodies sometimes that respond to sadness. In, as you've thought about both micro failures and macro failures, have there ever been those moments where you're actually surprised by joy? Yeah. I mean, people who know me would, would say that I'm very constrained in my expressions of joy, right? They'll say things like, you know, you're an introvert or it's hard to read you or you're like a robot, right? You just get into the facts, right? And it's very little on the emotional side. That's sort of who I am and I've come to understand how others perceive me in that way. But internally, you bet, right? Like, I mean, you know, you work on something for a long time and you finally get that customer, you finally get that, you know, exit or you finally get that financing round or whatever it is, you know, there's a real high associated with that. And you feel like there's so much opportunity in front of you in that moment. But that is like 1% of the moments, half of 1%, one quarter of 1%, one tenth of 1%, Mm -hmm. right? It doesn't happen very often. Now I'm, you know, early in my career, I definitely remember, you know, deeply, you know, being momentarily depressed or, you know, that day about something, right? Like I, like metaphorically hitting the wall, like I remember actually hitting the wall, right? With my fist. Um, And that's because it piled up and someone who doesn't express emotions maybe as much as other people do, um, where, you know, it reaches a boiling point and I walk into the hallway of the stairwell, right? In my first company and I literally hit the wall and I really hurt my hand and I never forget, you know, David Brown, who's, you know, my co-founder here at Techstars, right? We've been working together a long time. You know, he was up that day. He's like, I see how this is going to work. This is, there's a lot of good stuff going on. Yeah, we lost one. Right. And for me, it was just a a sort of final straw, right? Certain Mm -hmm. situation. It wasn't that that thing was so devastating. I think it was just a loss of a customer, but he, he brought me up in that moment. Right. So I think, you know, what I learned over time is not to let it boil over like that, right? That it's okay to be bummed out when it's happening. And I try to control the highs in the same way, right? Like, that's great. We finally got that done. That took six months, right? Even though it's exciting. And so, you know, it's all a balancing act. And I think as I've gone through my career, I've recognized that a little mm-hmm. bit more than I did early on. And I haven't hit the wall since. Yeah. So some of you have alluded to multiple times now, and it's a fun topic to kind of intersect with failure is the idea of community and how relationship can buoy us in these moments. It's something, especially the startup community loves to talk about. We're building ecosystems, right? We love to talk about how these things all work together. What's the role of community in the startup world, but also just in this journey of understanding what failure means in our own journeys? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, community is an important part of what we do at Techstars. We try to make sure that entrepreneurs don't feel alone. And it's really why I started it, you know, why why we started it is it's pretty easy to feel alone, right? As a CEO, as a founder, but you're not, right? And so creating community around that is super valuable. So I think, you know, the story I would tell you here is about an early Techstars company called EventView. And I'll illustrate how it can be really powerful as a community to come together, particularly around failure. So EventView was a 2008 tech stores company that failed. But for a while, right, people were really excited about it. I invested in it personally. It's before we had funds. Many others invested in it. It was a conference event management platform. It started off great. And over time, it was just clear that the thing wasn't going to grow and the founders had done their best. And you know, they needed to shut it down. It wasn't going to work. They weren't going to be able to raise more money. They didn't have the revenue they needed. And it was sad, right? They had a valiant effort that didn't work. And that's how I thought about it. And then, you know, they felt terrible for having lost my money and other people's money and wasted, you know, maybe their own time and energy and our time and energy on something that didn't work. The community around Techstars and specifically at that time in Boulder celebrated the death of EventView. 
they had a literal, you know, sort of funeral wake, wake. for the company. <laughs> uh, they carried the founders jokingly through the streets Wow! and uh, hundreds of people. And they said, great job. You know, that was, you tried your best. You did everything you could do. You built some really cool stuff. Wasn't the right, right thing at the right time. You attract some amazing investors, right? They were telling them all the good things. And, you know, those guys were really down. If you fast forward the clock uh, a few years, you know, one of the founders of that company stayed around Boulder, joined the management team of a company called Ganip, mm -hmm. who valued... Well acquired by Twitter, right? Correct. Who yep. valued the experience that that founder had been through and the learnings, right? And, you know, Rob became an important part of that management team. That company, as you said, was bought by Twitter. Twitter then, you know, opened an office in Boulder with a bunch of mm -hmm. people in it. And this community supported the guy when he was down and he was able to triumph years later and do things for the community that were much bigger than that simple show of support. Yeah. So I think what we can all think about is how do we support the failure? It's a part of the process. It's not anything that you should, you know, get down on someone for. It's that you should go hire that person, right? Or give that person another opportunity or just view it as part of the progress of life, right? It can be super powerful. So that's the role of community and how that's powerful cool. it is. Yeah, that's really cool. I've heard about communities doing like little idea wakes, you know, business funeral kind of things. So I, I, I didn't know Boulder did that for them. That's really, really powerful stuff. Something that we're growing in as a society talking about is mental health. And it's something the startup community is doing a better job talking about, identifying, providing solutions around. What's your view on how this is going in the startup community and how maybe somebody who's struggling with this, how they should help themselves or steps, steps they could maybe take to help themselves in that way? Yeah, and it ties back to your community question, right? I think you know, recognizing that you're not alone, being part of a system that has support infrastructure. You know, a lot, a lot of entrepreneurs toil away in their you know, dark office and, you know, order pizza every night. And that's sort of what they do. And it, it can be very lonely. So find a CEO group, find a co-founder group. Um, you are not alone in the feelings that you're having about, you know, something not working or being depressed about it. You know, we're fortunate in the context of something like Techstars, right, which is now you know, over 300 people, we can have resources for this mm. and we can put focus on it. So you can find links on the website. You can know that it's something we talk about in orientation. You can know that there are resources that are an email or a phone call away, not just in your local accelerator program, but in the organization mm. and even outside the organization that we make available. So I think, you know, great strides have been made, but it's still a huge, huge problem. And you know, you take any system, you know, our system has thousands of portfolio companies, you know, that's a large system, but any system of, you know, venture capital fund that has 50 portfolio companies, I mean, they are dealing with these issues, right? It, mm. And so, you know, for us, we see every version of it, unfortunately, all the way up to, you know, suicidal activity, right? And, and it's terrible. And the key is to let people know that there is someone you can call and you're not alone. And we are doing a better job of it, but it's a real challenge long term. Yeah. And the startup ethos overall is, is just like the kind of warrior spirit of like kind of grit your teeth and get through it, which we have to have in the startup community very much. But so I think sometimes the talk of this is hard and mental health is an issue for me. I think it sometimes feels in Silicon Valley's culture that they kind of are tugging against each other as much as we're trying on the mental health side. There's also, we celebrate the guy who's working a hundred hours a week and we know that sleep is actually one of the largest factors in mental health, right? Like, so we kind of have some of these competing ideas and we're still really trying to get to balance and health on it. I think. Absolutely. And, and I think, you know, you could point at uh, Techstars Accelerator and you could say that's a three month pressure cooker, right? Where we really do a lot in three months. It, you know, people tell you coming out of that, it's like two years of being in the wild. But there's a price, right? Which is, again, on day one, we try to do a good job of saying, we're going to ask you to do something for the next three months that is unsustainable. This is not to be celebrated. And just saying that, right? Because yeah. what you don't want is to teach them that that's how they should behave. Hey, you have a unique opportunity in the next 90 days to meet a lot of people really quickly that can be really impactful on your company. That's what an accelerator is. Mm -hmm. It can accelerate you into the wall as fast as it can accelerate you to success. <laughs> be careful. Yeah. But, you know, 
please don't try to behave this way in your normal life. And please do go home and sleep to your point, right? We ask them to read Why We Sleep before the program starts, which I think is a great book. If you haven't read it, it'd be my top recommendation for entrepreneurs. Nice. And, you know, I think recognizing when you are putting that pressure on yourself that it isn't normal and that you have to have strategies for dealing with it long term. Maybe this is offensive to say, but I kind of have been reminded of like the show and movie Jackass, right? It's like, this is what we're doing is insane, but this is not meant to be done at home. You know, like the whole, we're doing this now. And that's the whole model for 90 days is insanity and intensity, but this is not real life. This is not how you should be. Living. Yeah, I think early on we didn't say that. And now we say that on day one or even before day one. Yeah. And look, you know, no one should feel that they have to work, you know, 15 hour days. That's not what we're saying. We know many of you will anyway right? But, you know, to take advantage of this, right, it's a tight window of time. And we're trying to figure out, you know, ways to, you know, provide support even in that context. But the key is to understand if you're in a marathon, right, like this little sprint, you can't sprint the whole way. It's just not going to work, mm -hmm. right? You can sprint at times, but find a way and have a strategy to balance that out. Yeah. One of the things we're seeing with social media now is how much curation we do to highlight our wins and ignore our losses. And, you know, there's a lot of fascinating stuff coming out about how social media is, you know, it just creates this weird perception about what success means because we're not showing the failures. In the tech world, how do you think social media is going to kind of tease itself out as a society when we're kind of going right now we're in this window where we've got Instagram influencers and all this stuff. And we're just kind of going, what is this really going to be like for a society to have this kind of pressure? Yeah. It's funny. Like when I think about that type of social media, it sort of inevitably goes the way of the news, right? Where the news is entertainment. It's a show generally speaking, it has a viewpoint, you know, whether that's John Oliver or, or Fox News, right? Like it, you know, it could be a comedy show. It could be a uh, real credible quote unquote news. And I think social media has a lot of the same problems. Like it is people promoting themselves, promoting their points of view and a super interesting debate going on, you know, as we're speaking right today that the story is around, you know, will Facebook do more? What has Twitter done? You know, political mm -hmm. mentions. Yeah. It's fascinating, right? But it, I am a little pessimistic about it. And I think it devolves into, you know, sort of news with a point of view delivered a different way, right? From people that have power in the community. And, you know, we'll always invent new ways to circumvent that. But when those things get to the point where, you know, our president uses it, it's hard to have it be, you know, based on the merits, right? It's based on where the power is. And nobody's figured out how to solve that yet. So I, th I think it gets into that zone in the foreseeable future. Mm. What would you say is a bad piece of advice you've received? Maybe the worst advice you've ever received. And here's how I'd want you to think about that. A piece of advice you received that maybe once applied, you realize later brought about a stumble or a snafu. I think sometimes, you know, when I think about a question like this, it's sort of misinterpreted advice, right? I saw something amazing somewhere. It was in two columns and it was like conventional wisdom, a phrase we've all heard, you know, contrasted with the exact opposite thing as a phrase we've all heard. And it was just like dozens of them. <laughs> so yeah. you know, this sort of advice is situation specific and is not always right. And so one example I'll give you is never look back, which many people have said that to me, like you can't control what happened with eye contact, David, you can't control that that company failed. Well, actually, you know, you should be super introspective about what you've learned from the past, especially from your failures. Mm -hmm. Juxtapose these two things make no sense. So I think, you know, what happens to people is they apply the advice in a way that's not relevant for them. Mm -hmm. And they, they view it as a truism where it's, you know, most advice is specific to a set of experiences, carries a set of biases and, you know, should be taken alongside other advice and you should make your decision. What's really fun thought exercise for people is take any conventional wisdom you've ever heard and you can think of a situation where it was wrong, right? 
So, you know, it's how you apply it and just recognize that's what it is. Mm-hmm. And ultimately you make the decision and the advice is just data and input to that decision. Mm-hmm. One of the ways to look back on hard seasons in life is, and this is a very binary and biased view, but sometimes hard seasons in life, we'd say we're more of the victim. And I don't love that word. I don't like to promote victimhood, but the idea of like sort of there's other stuff that was driving this, maybe macroeconomic, whatever. And other times where we'd say we're the villain. Are there any recent moments where you actually paused and went, oh, Dave's the villain this time. Gosh. Um, you know, I can't think of one on the top of my head, which is a terrible answer to your question because I'm sure there's someone out there saying, oh, I know what that one is. Oh, I got a, whole, I got a list. <laughs> yeah, I know what David did to me. You know, you try to live by a set of principles, right? But, you know, I think when you first asked the question, it was, it was popped into my head that's like, you know, the villain thing, right? Like, you can only control what you can control, right? So if the stock market crashes by half and the angel round that you're in the middle of raising goes away, like that's not on yeah. you. Right. And, right. and it's, you are in a way the victim, but you're not the intended victim. Right? right. And so the world's not out to get you and that company may fail because it can't raise that money. But I'm struggling to think of the one that, you know, gosh, I feel like I took advantage of the situation or whatever. I'm sure they're out there, but well, if a listener writes in to yeah. say, to tell me one, Oh. Get plenty in the comments, I'm sure. <laughs> and, and I'll use it to be introspective. Yeah. Uh, but nothing's jumping to mind. Yeah, good. Who would you say is the bravest person that you know? Gosh. In the context, I mean, you know, I'd I give you a couple of the probably somewhat standard answer. I mean, you know, when I think about my family, right, my, my wife, you know, having a kid, raising a kid, being focused on that, sort of managing the, the empire, if you will, right, because I'm off doing this play thing that I do. That willingness to jump into that, like having no idea what it was going to be like and sort of totally owning it, um, mm-hmm. I definitely think of, I, you know, I think of a lot of the entrepreneurs I know, right, that ask themselves, well, what's the worst thing that could happen if I start this company, right? So, you know, thinking about someone like Isaac Saldana, right, who's a immigrant to this country from Mexico, right, that started a little company called SendGrid because he had a problem and the, the, the sort of bravery to bring in two CEOs while he was still there, right, to replace himself twice, replace even the person he replaced, but to stay on the board, to not leave or feel the ego around that is very easy to feel. And to see that through to a thing that impacts so many people, you know, being someone who isn't accepted maybe by a lot of people or people think that they couldn't do it, but just saying, you know what, I'm going to do it. And it's not, I'm going to go get rich. It's, I want to make this change in the world. And so I just, I respect the nonprofits, the entrepreneurs, right. That, that have a view of what they want to change and they go do it. And to me, that's, you know, enormous amount of bravery. And I would also be remiss not to mention plenty of people that are in military service. Mm. You know, it's, yes, I can't even imagine what they go through. And I was just at a Air Force sort of venture capital event with a thousand, they call them airmen, but mm-hmm. plenty of women uh, there too. Yep. And, air people, uh, maybe they need to rebrand. No, they called it an airman. And, air, and air human? <laughs> I met Airman Jenny a couple times, which was weird. <laughs> um, but, you know, like they're out there taking a lot of risks too. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's a completely different foreign world to me that I'm just thankful for that. So there's so many people around us all that we should thank for just the amazing, brave things they do. Yeah. This is a side comment that maybe we won't make it into the cut, but it's always fun to think about, does that person know that? And specifically when you mention your wife, does she know that you think she's one of the bravest people that you know? I doubt it, but you know, I'll send her the podcast. <laughs> maybe I'll get some, some credit for that. Yeah, there you go. It's like sending flowers. Here's a link to a podcast I was on. Totally. Same thing. <laughs> Same thing. Oh, she'll love that. What's really cool thinking about that question that comes up a lot, spouses are really common, which is wonderful. Wonderful hearing that answer. And something I love too is that a lot of investors would say the same thing about the entrepreneurs that are around. Even though it's the entrepreneurs that are coming to the investors hat in hand at times, right? Looking for help to grow. 
there's a sense of admiration the other direction from investors that I think is a wonderful part of the startup ecosystem. Yeah, and it, the admiration coming from the entrepreneurs towards the investors is completely misguided, of course. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, that we depend on the entrepreneurs to do everything we do. And just so, you know, great to be able to work with such motivated, mission-driven people, right? Mm. And so, you know, there is a little bit of, like, VC worship that happens, like, you know, you're controlling this money. But, it, you know, those people have the same imposter syndrome that, that you have as a CEO, right? They're like, why are these people believing in me to do this? And, right. you know, some roll the dice correctly three times in a row and build a reputation, right? Others build systems that can, you know, scale and sustain, you know, returns, but it's a business like any other. And I think the admiration that's due is all towards the entrepreneurs because it, it is incredible bravery to go and start a company and change the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that. That's something that the bolder tech community tends to do really well is the kind of, hey, I know the VCs get a lot of credit in the startup world, but you know, this is about the entrepreneurs doing the thing. Right? It's kind of the, the man in the arena kind of idea, right? Like they're the ones building the stuff every day. Yeah, I might be, I might be like slapping them on the back when they go in the ring, right? And, and giving them a piece of advice about, you know, what jab to throw, but they're, they're in the fight, right? Yeah. And that's the hard thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Looking forward, Dave, and this is kind of a strange question. Are there any mistakes that you plan to make or see on the horizon and are actively managing around? I mean, naturally, as a VC, this is what you're actually, that's your job is to think about sort of risk adjusted success. But what else comes to mind in your journey next three years? Yeah. um, You know, I think the sort of controversial thing, right, that this brings to mind is, you know, maybe the mistake we're about to make, or maybe it's right, is that we're just not a VC, right? We're fundamentally a different animal from venture capitalists, and we're we're beginning to talk about that, right? We have a completely different kind of performance profile that is much more reliable as a type of asset that we're investing in at the very earliest stage with such high diversification, and, you know, we're going to lose some LPs over that, I'm sure, that, that say, you know, well, I want to be in the conventional 20 portfolio company where you sit on the board and, you know, whatever. And then others are going to say, wow, it looks like you have really great performance here. And, you know, I can start to see this as a system, right, given the scale that you have. And so I think what's happening is there's a new sort of sub-asset class of venture capital that's emerging. You know, we've seen a clear emergence of the post-venture capital stack with, you know, SoftBank and TPG and all these, you know, hundred million dollar checks flying around. But the same thing has happened at the angel scale where it's, it's really professionalized. And I think people tend to lump them in, but those are three different games, right? Sort of pre-seed accelerator, seed up through series A is sort of a traditional game. And then that growth is also very, it's about all about access, right? To get into the, the very best deals. And as some are finding out, it's a hard game, right? Mm-hmm. So we're going to go, try to say something that the market is not used to hearing. That could be a huge mistake, but we believe it's true and you know, it'll cause some loss and hopefully more gain than loss. Yeah. Interesting. Dave, thanks for joining me today. I have one more question for you. As you look back on your journey, as you sit kind of where you are now, you talked about tennis and the loss of identity there. You started your own companies, some that have worked, some that have it. Now you're sitting in this kind of meta view as an investor, leading tech stars and all of the communities of tech stars around the world. As you think back on your biggest snafus and regrets, if you had a magic wand and you could wave that magic wand over your failures, maybe like eye contact, is there anything you'd change? In your story, anything that was a failure that you would change or would you say your journey is what it is and leave it like it's been? Yeah, I would definitely not touch a thing. Super easy question for me to answer. You know, I feel super fortunate, right, to do the job I do. I feel super fortunate with, you know, my own place in the world. You know, could I be the next, you know, Mark Cuban, like being on Shark Tank or whatever? Yeah, sure. There's a different path. Maybe if I thought about changing something in the past that you know, would bring billions overnight. Uh, yeah, nah, you know, because the utility of, of money and the utility of, of that towards happiness 
um, I don't feel like there's another level needed. And that's a really fortunate place to be. Mm-hmm. So the last thing I want to do is take the time machine and touch anything because I, I may not be where I am. And I, I love where I am, you know, in my fi- early 50s now, which is crazy to think about. But I know this is the last thing I want to do professionally. You know, I'm, I'm lucky that I don't need to do anything else professionally. And I don't really do it for any reason other than to help entrepreneurs succeed. And that's a pretty, to me, like a pretty great place to be in life. So Mm. wouldn't touch a thing. That's special. I mean, that kind of reflection to say, God slash the universe slash whatever you want to say has brought me to this point and it's been a fantastic journey and I wouldn't change a thing. What a cool miracle or blessing in even that reality, right? That's wonderful. Yeah. And that's what you wish for everybody, right? Because, you know, back to the piece of advice, right? Don't look back. Like you actually can't change it. So that magic wand doesn't exist. And oh, by the way, boy, little things, you know, butterfly effect, right? Huge consequences to, Mm -hmm. you know, if I hadn't founded eye contact, you know, maybe I wouldn't have met the people I met or had the experience of the loss that I had. And Mm -hmm. I just encourage people to generally look forward and, you know, try to find contentment because it doesn't come in money in the form of money. It doesn't come in the form of other people's perception of your success. It comes in the form of laying your head down on the pillow that night, you know, next to people you love and thinking about, you know, yeah, I'm really fortunate. And how can I give that back to others? Yeah. Yeah. That's special. Dave, thank you for your time today. This has been really great. And I, I think that one of the things that I heard over and over is just this, this kind of open handedness about failure, right? This idea of like, we can celebrate it. It's part of life we can learn from it. And the advice that we learn is contextualized, right? I mean, I think that's really, really powerful too, is that advice is not kind of always true. And there's wisdom in that as advice, (laughs) the, the, like everything in moderation, even moderation or whatever, right? Like that idea. Yes. Yes. Awesome. Jesse. Well, thanks for all you do. I think this is an important thing for people to be talking about. So thanks for doing that. Yes. Yeah. It's my honor to be part of this conversation in a small way. Thanks, Dave. There's a theme that you heard David echoes that is one of the key takeaways for me after this conversation, the theme of community. I'm not sure how to plot this on a graph, but let me try and articulate it. Like I think there's a direct relationship between the strength of a failed entrepreneur's community and their ability to rebound well and respond with optimism afterwards. So like for every unit of community support as an input, there's an equal unit of, I'm going to make this word up, reboundability where the community is that antidote to the pain of the flop. People who know you can look you in the eyes and say, you failed, but you're not a failure. I think those people really matter. No matter how many billions of dollars you're dealing with, these high flying tech startups are people, real humans. And that kind of community is is really powerful. They're not just some bystanders in the story. They're the protagonist's protagonist. They're the Jedi master almost guiding, you know, Luke Skywalker through the forests of Dagobah. Community is that buoy in the storm of epic crashes. Thanks for your insight, David. I appreciate your support in the Botchcast and and everything you've done for me and for your introductions. And you've been very generous. And that's something that Techstars is known for is generosity of community and connections and network. The next episode is one from the category we call the heart. My friend, Trisha Halsey, she tells a compelling personal story of running from failure so aggressively her whole life. The striving and stress created almost a toxic biological reaction. Her doctors at one point thought she may have cancer. Hers is a story of pausing, reflecting, of realizing she was in the rat race and backed off intentionally. But it was that fear of failure that drove her so intensely for so long. And now a benediction for the days ahead. On today's theme of startups and entrepreneurship, a simple quote from one of our iconic tech leaders, one of the legends of our time, Mr. Steve Jobs. I'm convinced that about half of what separates successful entrepreneurs 
from the non-successful ones is pure perseverance. Stay safe and sane out there. Ciao for now. Woo!